has the political compromise in Yemen requires new UN resolution. United Nations warns that current fighting in Ma'rib forces thousand civilians to flee. Healthy rebels renew shelling civilian areas in Hodeida, violating Stockholm peace agreement. Good evening and welcome to Yemen Today TV. This is the English News with me, Roshan Fouad. The United Kingdom stressed the need for a new Security Council resolution to reach a comprehensive political agreement. UK Ambassador to Yemen said in an interview with the Sharq al Awsat newspaper that a gap has occurred between the content of Resolution 2216 issued by the Security Council in 2015 and the situation on the ground that changes daily. He pointed out that this will be reflected in any future political agreements, stressing that any political settlement between the parties need a new UN resolution. The British diplomat suggested that the new UN envoy to Yemen, Hans Grunberg, will present a comprehensive peace plan soon. UN humanitarian coordinator in Yemen, David Gressley, said they have now been given authorization to access Abdeya, though security concerns remain. According to Reuters, Gressley believes that the situation now is quieter and aid access in the upcoming days could be greater, calling for the humanitarian corridor to be agreed by the warring sides. The UN top official added that a lot of supplies, food, medicine and rapid response kits that provide basic necessities for those who are displaced are being deployed. The international community called on houses to lift their siege on Abdeya. More than 35,000 civilians are at risk due to fighting and blocking humanitarian aids. More on this story is in the following report. The new United Nations Special Envoy for Yemen, Hans Granberg, told the Security Council in his last briefing that urgent political talks without preconditions are essential to negotiate a settlement for the conflict in Yemen. Granberg briefing may shed light on the main problem in Yemen that centers on the wide gap of trust. The trustless atmosphere in Yemen may have been originated from the Houthi unjust practices against the whole country and from their political and racial agenda with which they try to transform Yemen into a new Imam state supported in this regard by their Iranian ally. This fact is clear with Houthi refusal to apply any of the compromises they have reached to solve the crisis. Yemeni head of Senate Ahmed bin Daghr accused the rebels of failing to support the United Nations attempt to reach for a just and comprehensive peace. According to bin Daghr, Houthi refused to endorse the Kuwaiti document they agreed upon that included military, security and economic understandings. He added that Houthis hold up the Stockholm Agreement and benefited from the international lax stance. Ben Dagr added that the rebels are being steered from Iran, which looks to the Yemeni crisis as a pressure tool in their own nuclear crisis with the West. As to him, the solution in Yemen must stick to a comprehensive ceasefire, a national dialogue, and a national conciliation describing this regard as the United Nations rule as underplayed. The statements by the United Nations envoy and the Yemeni head of Senate coincides with the ruthless Houthi offensive on Ma'rib and a stifling blockade on Abdeya that end at the time being any hope for peace revival. Rising up the tone of fighting from the part of the Houthis may force Yemenis for more resistance and solidarity to restore their country. Resistance and resistance only may be the sole way for salvation out of the crisis in Yemen. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees said that about 800 families were forcibly displaced this week from their areas of origin in Ma'rib due to fighting. The organization expressed concern over recent developments in Ma'rib, where intense fighting forced hundreds of families to flee. A recent international report confirmed that fighting between Houthi militia and government forces led to creating seven new front lines across Ma'rib with Sana'a and Al Jawf. Meanwhile, confrontations remain sporadic in Hodeida, Al Dala, Al Baida, Sa'da, and Taiz, with no breakthrough since the Stockholm Agreement in December 2018. 
In Ma'rib, government forces backed by tribes targeted the Houthi positions in Sirwah Front. Field military sources said that government forces and tribes inflicted heavy losses in life and equipment among the rebels. To the south of Ma'rib, government forces backed by tribes regained Najat village in Al Juba after fierce battles. Sources in Al Juba stated that dozens of Houthis were killed during those confrontations. Houthi militia destroyed some citizens' homes in Madar area. Recently, Houthi militia targeted civilian areas and farms in Tohaita with heavy mortar shells. Houthi targeting of civilian areas forced the families to leave their homes, fearing from Houthi militia constant violations of Stockholm Agreement. To the western coast, Houthi militia received considerable human and equipment losses on several fronts. A military source stated that joint forces units stationed in Al Barah front west of Taiz engaged in clashes with Houthi rebels, killing and wounding a number of Houthi militia. Similarly, the joint forces units in Hodeida city thwarted Houthi militia attempts to create barricades near fire lines. Turning to the Kilo 7 area, joint forces defended Houthi attacks east of Hodeida. A military source said that the joint forces inflicted heavy losses over the rebels. The coalition announced the targeting of booby trap boats assembling site. The coalition said that four booby trap boats were destroyed in Al Jabena coastal camps in Hodeida. The coalition added that a total of 91 remote controlled trap boats were discovered and destroyed posing a direct threat to maritime security in Bab el Mandeb Strait and the Red Sea. The head of the General People's Congress branch in Ma'rib, Sheikh Mansour al Sayyadi, escaped an assassination attempt carried out by the Houthi militia. A source close to Sheikh al Sayyid said that joint forces and the Houthi explosive device exploded in a Sayyadi's convoy, killing two people and wounding his son. To Ta'iz, the Haq al-Ahdal, a leading member of the Muslim Brotherhood, was killed. Local sources said that the masked gunman riding a motorcycle assassinated al-Ahdal when he was leaving his house on Jamal Street, center of Ta'iz. The war in Yemen has impacted all factions in the society, yet vulnerable women have been hit severely, especially in the healthy controlled areas. This report has more in this story. Due to the ongoing armed conflict in Yemen since the end of March 2015, Yemen is undergoing a humanitarian crisis worldwide. The conflict has brought numerous accusations of violations and abuses of international human rights law and violations of international humanitarian law. The events have been brutal and have had cruel consequences on all civilians, but especially on the lives of women and young girls. Due to the tension and chaos of the crisis, combined with the deep-rooted gender inequality, conditions for women and girls in Yemen are deteriorating as the conflict drags on. Women and girls have been left vulnerable to inhuman violence, physical and psychological abuse and exploitation. The most vulnerable group of women exposed to violence in Yemen is marginalized, poor and rural women. While conditions of poverty tend to intensify forms of incidences of violence against women, rural women are also forced to carry out most agricultural work and physical labor. Thousands of Yemeni women have been at the top of the lists of victims of Houthi militia fire six years ago. There are many forms of Houthi violations against women, which range from deprivation of the right to work and a decent life to direct assault with murder, torture, kidnapping and enforced disappearance, and crossed red lines after documenting cases of rape against female prisoners in the Putschist detention centers. A report was issued by the National Committee to Investigate Human Rights Violations, 
backed by the United Nations, revealed that more than 2,000 women and girls were victims of Houthi militia fire. According to the report, the committee documented the killing and injury of 2,617 women and girls during the period from 2015 to the end of 2020 following the indiscriminate bombing that targeted residential neighborhoods in a number of Yemeni governorates. According to the National Committee, it has completed investigations into the number of 726 women who were subjected to forced displacement from their areas under arms and coercion, which led to their exposure, along with their children, to various forms of risks associated with insecurity. The National Committee pointed out that Yemeni women in Houthi-controlled areas face various types of violations, including the confiscation of their right to express opinion and demonstrate, as the Houthis have imprisoned hundreds of women in their own prisons and practiced various types of torture and violations against them. Despite the different ways in which women have been affected and suffering as a result of the conflict, Yemeni women remain strong to protect their homes, their children and their families from the hands of the rebels. Coming next. War wounded soldiers, endless painful medication journeys abroad. الواحد مئة مئة وعشرين ألف والكيس الدقيق بثمانة عشر ألف والكيس السكر اليوم بعشرين ألف كم بعلي بيعطي هذا الراتب كامل بكيس سكر وكيس دقيق المواطن اليمني يعيش في أزمة إنسانية وغذائية مؤلمة من غلى الأسعار وفحشة الأسعار وغلى الصرف والعملة الأجنبية في البلد حالة الحين حالة لما نقدر نمشي القيلة ما نقدرش نأكل الأكل داخل ما ما إحنا بحاجة صعبة Welcome back Hardship of the war wounded soldiers seeking medication abroad aggravates due to governmental indifference. The following report documents one story of those injured soldiers. Salah al Muhammadi is a citizen from Taiz who was injured during war and has come to Cairo to be treated from war injury. He is abandoned here in the Egyptian capital, Cairo, as no one looks after him. Salah wants to be treated at his own expense, yet, according to him, he did not receive any of his financial rights and salaries from war wounded committees. Salah was stationed in the 84th Ground Forces Brigade in Saada Governorate. He was shot in the head, which led to him being semi-paralyzed, causing him to lose the ability to move normally. But authorities neglect affects him more. <laughs> I am Salah al-Muhammadi, a wounded soldier affiliated with the 84th Brigade in Kitaf Axis, 6th Military District, Saada, Governorate. I was shot in the head at Jabal al during battles with the Houthi militia. I am now semi-paralyzed and am facing difficulties in paying the fees for treatment sessions. Currently, I'm being treated at my own expense. I do not receive any money and I cannot cover the costs of eating and drinking, renting an apartment and physiotherapy sessions that the doctor advised me to do so. Salah spends his time inside this modest apartment without an escort, despite his great need for it. From here, he calls on government to look after the wounded and not to abandon them. Looking after war wounded is one of the most important duties because they sacrifice their lives in defense of the homeland. I'm currently in Egypt treated and I do not have a companion to help me. I'm alone and there is no one to take care of me. I call on the government and Ministry of Defense and the President, the Vice President, to consider the wounded. I call on the leadership of Taiz, represented by Nabil Shamsan, the governor, and the Speaker of the House of the Representatives, 
to consider the wounded who sacrificed their lives for the sake of the country and to support me to get over this difficult phase in my life. The Yemeni embassy in Cairo confirmed that the war wounded in Egypt are estimated to be more than 3,700. They receive medical care and financial dues from committees and medical attaches of the Ministry of Defense. Salah hopes that his name will be included in those lists, assuming that authorities will not turn their back on the wounded and those who sacrificed themselves for the nation. In Sana'a, a health militia issued a decision banning the sale and purchase of real estate without referring to their intelligence services. Health militia sees real estate and citizens' property through what is called Security and Intelligence Agency, which is under the direct supervision of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. ACAP's organization concerned with providing analysis of the humanitarian situation said the war in Yemen depleted people's lives and prices of basic commodities doubled more. The report confirmed this year 16.2 million people in Yemen are expected to face high levels of acute food insecurity and the economic war between the government and houses has led a shortage of fuel and basic commodities. According to the same report, Yemenis have also suffered from disease outbreaks, including coronavirus, cholera, diphtheria, and dengue fever. An estimated 17.9 million people lack adequate health care, and only 50% of health facilities are still fully functional. Economists consider the government's decision as futile and ineffective. The experts called on the central bank to stop and withdraw the licenses of exchange companies that have in their treasury more than 4 billion Yemeni rials, as it is a currency speculation, since the supply of Yemeni rials is huge and contributes to making prices and the collapse of the economy. Despite poor climates, Yemeni youth, especially women, continue to contribute in the cultural life in different ways. This report tracks the story of such creative youth artist Saba El Jalles. From the heart of the suffering due to war and the conditions of diaspora, Yemeni talent sprang up in various fields of life, including the art that emerged in the countries of diaspora through artists who summarized the human tragedy in the country through paintings, including the Yemeni young woman Saba Jalles, who found herself in the midst of an art experience fine. The exhibition's name is Autar and it contains nearly 80 portraits or even more. I drew half of them with oil paint and the other half I drew them about war atrocities. After the war I started drawing more because I wanted to get rid of the negative energy and drawing was my reality escape. More than 80 paintings included in the exhibition of the artist Saba varied between the paintings that conveyed some aspect of human suffering and the challenges of living conditions in a war-torn country, unique in fine art. The artist knows how to show the pain and suffering through her drawings. If you focus on the drawings, it shows the pain, but at the same time, it shows hope. After the artists found themselves in Yemen, the weakest link in the conflict, they went out to the countries of diaspora, including Egypt, which opened its doors and welcomed its Yemeni brothers who searched for decent living opportunities away from war, including art, which gave them the opportunity to convey a special philosophy they believe in and are inspired by their artistic abilities through the expressions. I came today to attend the exhibition of the Yemeni artist Saba. The drawings are amazing and what touched me the most is the drawings related to the war. Yemen possesses a depth of civilization from which artists draw inspiration from their works, especially the artists who were distinguished by special methods in the art of painting, including Saba, who formed an honorable model for conveying a beautiful image of Yemeni art with its ancient times and originality and was able to deliver a proud message about her country despite the war that entered its seventh year. Here's a reminder of the main headlines. The United Kingdom says that the political compromise in Yemen requires new UN resolution. 
United Nations warned the current fighting in Ma'rib forced a thousand civilians to flee. Healthy rebels renew shelling civilian areas in Hodeida, violating Stockholm peace agreement. This is the end of the news. It was Roshan Fouet. Thank you for watching.